Uh, <clears throat> all right, um, my talk is, is what you might call power pointless. So I'm trying to entertain you here without uh, any kind of supporting material. Um, if, like me, you got one of these things, a mobile phone, um, you might have experienced, well, all the positive sides of it, but also some of the, well, interesting psychological phenomena attached with owning one of these things. One of the most fascinating things about mobile phones is that they cause something that's called PVS, or Phantom Vibration Syndrome. If, as a good member of the audience, you put your phone on silent mode, but it's still vibrating for important text messages, it might occur that you suddenly feel something in your pocket, you pick up your phone to only to find out that nothing has happened. Um, Phantom Vibration Syndrome is extremely common. About nine out of 10 adolescents owning a mobile phone has reported PVS. The interesting thing with PVS is that it's strongly modulated by expectancy, by context, by things that you expect to happen. And they tested this out in medical interns. So medical interns, the, start, the moment that they start the residency, are given a pager. And um, in this particular experiment, the, uh, the investigators asked these medical interns before the onset of their internship, well, how often do you experience PVS? Turns out that there were normal adolescents, so frequently often, but not every day. Now, the interesting thing happened, that is, just after a couple of days in the residency, all of these medical interns started to experience PVS on a regular basis. Now, it's actually quite logical if you think about phantom vibration syndrome in terms of how the brain deals with information that comes in from the external world. Um, I hate to bring this to you, but your brain is actually a pretty lazy system. We may think of the brain as a, a superior machine that, that, that processes data that, that is coming in and, and provides us with an accurate picture of the world, but that's not the case. What we experience, what we see, what we feel, what we hear, is predominantly what we expect to see, what we expect to see a feel, uh, what we expect to hear. And PVS is just a very interesting, everyday example of that. Now, as it turns out, nature does its own PVS uh, experiments as well. You may have heard about the uh, Groningen Phantom earthquake. It occurred about two months ago in, uh, in Lopperson. Um, it, it's quite interesting to look at if you go to Twitter and uh, you look for messages from February 4th. You will find that around 10 p.m., a lot of people in Groningen, Lopperson, sort of the northern part of the province, but also including a couple of reports in the city itself, they report a loud rumbling noise and very strong tremors. So they really felt the earth shaking beneath their feet. Now the odd thing is, there is no, absolutely no evidence that there was an earthquake at that particular moment. The Royal uh, Meteorological Institute in the build did not register any kind of, of seismographic activity for that specific time and that specific day. So what went on? Well, as you may realize, or may uh, remember, around that time, these Groningen earthquakes caused by uh, natural gas extraction were a big thing in the media. So a lot of people were very anxious that they might experience a strong earthquake. Now, what did happen on February the 4th is that probably an aeroplane, a jet plane, uh, broke through the sound barrier, probably across Ameland. And that caused this boom. A lot of people heard the boom, and apparently, their brains got creative and sort of started to invent these well, tremors that they felt along with it to explain this sudden sound that they heard. Now, as you may know, uh, uh, people from Groningen are not people that easily get carried away with, with things. They're nuchter, as we say in Dutch, or with both feet on the ground. Um, so it really shows that it can be a very powerful thing, this expectancy thing, and that even uh, Groningers can be fooled by their own minds. Now, as a researcher, I'm interested in these kinds of phenomena. Um, and in the lab, well, of course, I cannot do phantom earthquakes, but at least what I can do is make see people see things that aren't there. So in the lab, we approach these situations by putting a participant in front of a screen and then uh, asking the, the participant, well, did you see a face or did you see a house or whatever? Typically, I use tasks in which I tell people, okay, you're going to see a lot of noise on this computer screen, like you're watching a TV tuned to the wrong channel, and occasionally a face will pop up. And I want you to press a button whenever you see a face. Now, participants are quite well able to detect faces when they are there, but interestingly, quite often, participants think that they see a face even if there's no face presented. 
What I really like about this particular paradigm is that it allows me to also record brain activity of these participants. And what I find then typically is that seeing a face, even if it's not there, is associated with very specific brain processes. So it can really sort of peek into the participant's mind, brain, in order to see what the participant sees. And that really gives you a very interesting way of looking at how your brain creates the world how your brain sort of puts all the information that comes in together with all this stuff that's already going on, all the things that you already expect. Now, this view on, on, on how your brain creates the world based on expectancy and likelihood is not particularly new. Um, it's, it's been around since the late 1990s and it's called the Bayesian brain hypothesis. Basically, the Bayesian brain hypothesis states that perceptual processing, so processing all the information that comes on in via the senses, occurs in a way that you might call Bayesian. What you see is the most likely thing to be out there based on information coming in through the senses and based on what you know about the world. If I would see a black and white pattern here in this particular room, only very briefly flashed, I might probably interpret it as a carpet. The same pattern might trigger the percept of a real living cow when I'm in a meadow. So that's sort of the idea. Now, where my research is a bit different than that, what most people do in, in this Bayesian brain uh, uh, idea, is that I'm not just interested in what people do on their own when they're behind the computer. Um, as you know, we are a social species. People do stuff together. We influence each other. According to the Bayesian brain hypothesis, your brain gets all that information by means of previous exposures. So what you have seen before, what you have experienced before, that influences the way you perceive the world but we also influence each other. Now, in social psychology, there's this famous experiment, or series of experiments, by Solomon Ash. Um, it's from the 1950s, and the basic idea is this. You have a participant entering a room where eight participants are already inside. Now, these eight participants, unbeknownst to the actual participant, are actually confederates. And the participants have to do a fairly simple task. They have to save which of two lines is the longer line, for example. And these tasks are quite easy, but they have to take turns. And um, the typical setting is something like this. First, the first confederate says, oh, line A is longer. Well, in fact, line A is the shorter line. So the actual participant, who is sort of last in line, might think, okay, maybe the first one did not bring his or her glasses. So participant two gives the answer, says, oh, line A is the longer one. So, the last participant thinks, hmm, that's odd. And so this goes on until all seven uh, or eight confederates have given, deliberately given, the wrong answer. Now then something interesting happens. The actual participant then might on purpose give the wrong answer. And traditionally in social psychology this has been interpreted as, well, trying to conform to a group norm. You are giving the wrong answer because you don't want to stand out. It might actually be that the other ones got it right and you, that you are the dummy. And if seven people or eight people give a different answer than you, well, it might be that those people are right. Now, we did a very similar thing with this task I just told you about. So, letting participants look at a screen of noise constantly moving and then detecting faces. We did it with only three people, so two of them confederates. But the basic idea is the same. Participants are looking at the screen and they have to take turns in telling me, what do you see? So, the two fake participants, the confederates, say, hey, I see a face. Second one says, oh, I see a face as well. And then the third participant thinks, but that's odd, I really don't see a face. But, okay, these two say that they have seen a face, and I press face. Now, the nice thing is that I have these EEG techniques, so these brain reading techniques, to actually peek into the actual participant's mind and sort of get an idea, what does this person see? Is he just saying he sees a face? Or is he actually seeing that face? Now, I would not be standing here all excited and, and, and be very uh, happy about my results if it were indeed the case that the participant actually sees the face. And that fits well for in part with this Bayesian brain idea. We produce a picture of the world in our minds that's based on our previous experiences, but also based on what other people think. And actually, the, the fascinating thing is that the influence of others is a lot stronger than you might expect. In this experiment, for example, we found that if we give a participant a small hint via the computer, well, he takes that hint seriously. So if the computer says, hey, you're going to see a face, well, the participant might indeed see a face, if, even if that face is not there. 
But if it's not the computer saying him that, uh, uh, telling the participant that he or she is going to see a face, but another person, the likelihood that that person will report a face is about three times as high. So that means that we listen to other people's opinions, and even to such an extent that we might change our conscious perception of the world, our experiences of the world, based on what other people think. And you might wonder, well, what's that good for then? Why would we give up perceptual autonomy? Well, there might be two reasons for that. First thing is coordination. We're a social species. We do stuff together. If I have to lift a heavy table, it's quite convenient to sort of share my impressions of how heavy that table is amongst the group, because otherwise I might exert a lot of force, but the person across from me who did not really properly feel the table might just, well, not do his best at all. Another thing is, groups are smart. What I brought here is the piggy bank of my son. He doesn't know that I brought it, so I have to be back at five before he gets home from uh, a daycare. Um, but typically at county fairs you will see sort of jars like these filled with cents or beans or there's a cow or whatever. Um, and you have to guess how many cents are in this jar or how heavy is that cow. Now if I would ask all of you individually how much does this weigh, probably most of you would be wrong. But if I would average all your individual answers, it's quite likely that you have the right answer. So that, why do we forfeit our perceptual autonomy? Well, probably because the group knows better. And that actually creates a pretty interesting philosophical question with which I'm would be happy to talk to you in, uh, in the break, and that is if, according to our idea about science, sensory data, sense data, are sort of the authoritative source of all knowledge, so in order to establish whether something is true, I want to see it with my own eyes, but how much is that wor worth if what I see is largely determined by the people around me? And on that note, and to give you that as food for thought, I'd like to conclude this presentation. Thank you very much.